Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this uh, webinar. Welcome to LMU Special Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Yong Son Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, in California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, the benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past four years, and also sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the U.S. and Asian countries. Through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, and special lectures and movie screenings. LMU is also one of the 15 cyber universities in the country who received one of the most prestigious cyber grants award from the U.S. Department of Education. The LMU Cyber serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the U.S. business community with international education, the foreign language training, and research capacities. Our program today will cover a very timely and interesting topic, two major regional free trade agreements involving Asia-Pacific countries. Today, Asia is the new commercial center of the world. For example, 20 of the 25 most important ports in the world are in Asia. The RCEP, that is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, is currently the largest trade deal in the world, including 15 countries, and is recognized as a success on China's path to global leadership so that they can replace the U.S. from that wall. The U.S. versus China clash makes it impossible to talk about the RCEP without talking about TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnerships, which was a U.S.-led project that Mr. Trump ended abruptly as soon as he became president. However, its members decided to save it by creating the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP was originally envisioned by the U.S. as an economic bloc to counterbalance China's increasing power. Ironically, China recently formally applied to join the CPTPP that former President Trump abandoned. Furthermore, many countries are part of both RCEP and CPTPP treaties. So this webinar focuses on how CPTPP and RCEP influence to each other rather than opposing each other, and how this reflects the current global economic order in the context of US versus China conflict. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator who will lead this intriguing discussion, Professor Brian Peck. Professor Peck is the executive director of the Center for Transnational Law and Business, and also the adjunct professor of law at USC. He teaches international trade law and policy, global regulatory compliance, and international IP law. Okay, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today as a moderator for this special event. Now I'd like to ask you to introduce our speakers. Sure, and Yong Sun, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction and also for the opportunity to moderate. I think, as you mentioned, would be a very interesting and informative uh, discussion between our two distinguished panelists. Um, we're going to, each one is going to start off with a, of their own presentation followed by questions. Um, and and uh, Dr., uh, one of our first speakers, Dr. Deborah Elms, uh, has to unfortunately leave a little bit early. So in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly introduce her, have her give her presentation, uh, maybe ask a couple of questions, give him the time, and then it'll open up to the audience. So Dr. Debbie Elms is the founder and executive director of the Asia Trade Center. Her center um, works with governments and companies to design better trade policies for the region. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I, I can just say that Dr. Elms has a very long and distinguished career in the international trade policy, law, and economic fields. And so, uh, Debbie, uh, we'd be very interested to hear your remarks and observations on the key developments of the region as it relates to the RCEP and the CPTPP. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I apologize for having to leave early. I, I mismanaged my calendar, and, and I have to go <laughs> uh, elsewhere. Anyway, um, 
Yeah, I'm delighted to be here because I'm talking about trade developments in Asia, which have gotten extremely interesting, particularly in the last couple of weeks. So Asia moves at speeds that you don't often see. And so we've had three big developments in the last, um, well, really less than a month, actually. Uh, those three big developments, which I'll talk about briefly, is the launch of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, uh, which will come into force on January 1st. And so we got the 10 signatories we needed to bring that into force. Uh, the CPTPP, which was mentioned earlier, and the expansion of the CPTPP with the UK currently in accession negotiations and China and Taiwan both applying to join formally. And then a third agreement that I think is very interesting that is related uh, is the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement or DEPA, which China unexpectedly asked to join uh, last week. And Korea has already been negotiating uh, accession for a little over a month now under the radar uh, of everyone actually. So. Let me talk about those three developments briefly, and then I'm happy to take questions uh, from, from the audience uh, before I have to go. So on, on RCEP, what's interesting about RCEP, this is, as the headlines will often tell you, the, the world's largest trade agreement, which is sort of true and sort of not true. Uh, you know, I think that trade agreements come in different varieties. Uh, RCEP is not the next European Union. But in terms of straight free trade agreements, RCEP is an important one. It will have 10 members starting on January 1st. There were 15 countries that have signed the agreement. The last five will have entry into force when they have completed domestic procedures. And most of them are claiming to get this done by the end of this year. Uh, we'll see. I'm not really holding my breath on some of them. So the, the 10 that are in, let's hope I can get the numbers right. Um, Australia, Cambodia, China, Japan, Laos, New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. Ah, and I always forget the last one. So we have six in ASEAN plus four of the five dialogue partners, which is in this case, China, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. The missing one from the dialogue partners is Korea. Don't really understand what their issues are. We're missing a couple of important ASEAN members, most notably, I would say Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, uh, are also not on the very first day. So what does this agreement do in brief? It's a comprehensive agreement. It does goods, services, investment. There's 20 chapters involved. Um, it is not at the same level of quality that the Americans tend to like. So they tend to push what they call high standard, high ambition agreements. This is not quite that, although it is not as bad as you might have heard. So RCEP is um, comprehensive. It has, I think, an excellent intellectual property rights chapter. It has decent services and investment rules and commitments by the country. So we should see new uh, improved access for services and investment around the region. It has some mixed goods commitments. So tariff cuts, complicated, long, challenging for companies to use. I will tell you working with companies on this one, um, but it has one rule of origin. And so it will start to knit together Asia in a way that we haven't seen. Now, many people will say, well, Asia's got a lot of trade, which is true. We have a lot of trade. We have a lot of trade though, mostly in raw materials and parts and components. And then those get integrated into final goods, which are then typically exported out to the US or Europe, sometimes Japan. Uh, but they don't tend to stay with final products in Asia. And what I think RCEP does is they make it easier for you to design things in Asia for Asia, good services, investment, et cetera. Um, and I think it will accelerate Asian growth, uh, even though the very early stages of RCEP will be more modest in impact on sort of direct bottom line for companies than you might have hoped. There are pockets of, of benefits for different kinds of companies in different sectors. And over time, the benefits improve, of course. Uh, and the other thing that I think is crucial about RCEP is that it, you should view it as a floor. So you should say, this is the opening of RCEP. And then as with many things that ASEAN has delivered, it will improve over time. So there will be, as part of the process of this, regular meetings. Officials will meet, ministers will meet, leaders will meet. And in Asia, when you have that sort of cycle, you have to have them do something. You can't have your minister show up and have him say nothing. But sadly, it's almost always men in Asia. You can't have him show up and do nothing. So you have to give him a deliverable. And then he has to give his leader a deliverable. And so ultimately, 
you're going to be creating new kinds of rules and procedures, regulatory reforms, I think, in Asia that are consistent. Things like potentially new areas, new standards, maybe new labeling laws, hard to say where, where this will go. But the point is, it's a platform for discussing Asian trade and economic development that we didn't have before. And I think that makes RCEP interesting, not only for economic reasons, but also for the sort of future development of trade and, and policy in the region and potentially beyond. So RCEP coming into force January 1st, very important, very big deal. Many people thought it would never come. Here it is. The second development, and, and I, um, I'll go through this fairly briefly, uh, CPTPP. So we've had, CPTPP has been in force now for several years. Uh, we have eight countries. Peru just became the eighth one to formally be participating in this agreement in September. It was an original signatory. It took a long time in the Peruvian process to actually come into force, but now we have eight countries in the region, including seven uh, that are in both CPTPP and RCEP. Uh, important. So unlike RCEP, which has long time frames and can be has loopholes, basically. CPTPP has a lot fewer loopholes. So basically after four years of, of, of running, we are at near tariff free for all goods in, in the CPTPP countries. So almost everything is now zero tariffs. The last few tariffs will come off pretty quickly. And so we are basically in tariff free zone, which especially for small businesses is very big because it means that they can export without having to worry about tariffs, whatever their product is, goods, uh, whether, whether it's uh, industrial goods or whether it's agricultural products where we usually have heavy restrictions. So I think that's fantastic. All services, all investment already in place. The whole rule book has been active now for the last four years, three years. Um, and so I think re delivering real benefits actually for companies. What is also new about our uh, CPTPP is the expansion. So the UK came forward and we started accession procedures for the UK to join. And then we received two formal letters um, recently from China and then next day from Taiwan or Chinese Taipei. That is going to be very interesting, how the current members handle those new accession procedures. There is a lot of questions about, of course, politics, which I'm, I'm happy to let Bill deal with rather than me. Uh, the politics questions always come up. I would say in Asia, unlike other places, typically, Economics is divorced from all that other stuff, security, politics, whatever. And you see that in RCEP. So during the eight years of RCEP negotiations, at certain points, the Koreans and the Japanese could not be in the same room together. They, they would not even enter the same building. But in RCEP, they literally sat side by side because it was alphabetical. The Chinese and the Australians have had escalating difficulties on so many levels, they sat side by side, again, alphabetical in RCEP, and they managed to get this agreement and they managed to get it into force. So I think it is possible for you to have strong disagreements in politics or security or both, and still manage to cooperate in economics. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen in terms of letting China, especially into the CPTPP, but I, I suspect that they will at least launch the conversation. How long they will last, I don't know. How long that negotiation process will last, I don't know. And whether at the end of the day, we'll have the same kind of um, favorable circumstances for allowing Chinese entry uh, is unclear. But the point is, I suspect that they will actually start the negotiations at CPTPP. One of the areas where we have had lots of discussions about whether the Chinese are ready or able to be compatible with the high standards of the CPTPP is in the digital space. And CPTPP has some digital rules useful about data flows and about uh, where you host your data and about revealing source code. But many of those rules are old, old in digital space. <laughs> they were you know, finished in 2014, which is a long time actually for the digital world. Um, and they have certain loopholes attached to them. So I think China acceding to that there's a lot of exceptions. So, you know, if you want to take advantage of exceptions, I think you can still uphold the, uphold the rules, but use the allowable exceptions. What's interesting is Chinese accession or Chinese request to join, let me rephrase that, Chinese request to join the DEPA. So DEPA came from TPP. So TPP closed and some of the members, especially 
Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore said, actually, you know, the digital rules in T CPTPP are not as comprehensive as we would like because it was just difficult to get done and it was early days and we had a lot of things on our plate. So now let's make a new agreement. Let's make a digital only agreement that has modules in it and we'll pick the ideas or the issues or the topics that we think are relevant. And it could be everything from paperless trade and electronic invoicing to digital identities, artificial intelligence, open government data. We will make modules around this. And then some of them will be sort of hard and legally binding and some of them will be cooperation commitments. So we will just ask members to cooperate or to coordinate in these newer areas until we feel like we, we know what the rules ought to be. And then maybe we make legally binding commitments at that point. So that's what DEPA is. It, it's, it, it got off to a slow start because it happened and it was difficult, especially for Chile, which has had multiple governments in the last few years, Chile to approve it. All three are currently now entry into force members. So yay. Um, but also the pandemic has disrupted things. And so trying to get DEPA moving has been more challenging than I think people thought at the beginning, but China just asked to join and the Koreans asked last month. And so now we have this interesting experience of trying to negotiate or at least think about negotiating CPTPP, but also DEPA commitments. And if you can do DEPA, then you can do CPTPP. If you do TPP, can you also do DEPA? A little unclear, but there's sort of interesting uh, innovations taking place in the trade arena here in Asia. And again, it's, it's evolving quite literally day by day. Today is in fact, the leader summit for APEC, uh, another trade uh, initiative that links the US with Asia uh, and 21 other member economies. And that might have some interesting things attached to it, uh, particularly on environmental goods. That's what they've been trying to push very hard. Um, so the point, and, and let me just bring to a close here and then, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, the point is that we are doing a lot of innovative things, I think in the trade front in Asia uh, and the situation is evolving very rapidly, but the net result is that we have lots more trade and integration in this part of the world than you might expect given some of the pushback against trade in other locations. Uh, and it's an evolving space that needs to be watched carefully. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. Very informative and very interesting. And like I said, a lot going on, very dynamic situation between these three agreements, or at least two agreements and potential for a third one, the DEPA. So we have one question from the audience. Uh, and then if we have time in the minutes you have left, I have a couple of questions as well, but let me give a chance sure. for the audience first. So the first question is, is how do you see the US engaging or not engaging in these Asian agreements? Uh, not. Uh, again, I'm, I'm so delighted that you've got Bill uh, able to come in with, with his Washington experience um, because I think it's important. Uh, I think Washington has generally, I would say, been entirely too dismissive of RCEP. So I've been do, going to DC forever and trying to have conversations about why RCEP matters, why people should pay attention to it for years. And it was really difficult. I mean, it was really difficult. I would be at CSIS, for example, um, and we would get, you know, 10 people who would come and who would listen and they would be skeptical. They say, ah, this is never gonna happen. There's no way you can get these countries together in the same room. They're definitely not gonna be able to conclude something. And if they concluded something, it's not gonna be very good quality. And even if they did that and it wasn't very good, they're still never gonna bring it into force and it's never gonna matter. So it was so dismissive from you know way back. Um, and then here we are, we finished RCEP and actually, again, the quality is a little uneven. I'm not saying that it's equal to CPTPP, which I think is here and RCEP is sort of here, but that doesn't mean it's useless. It's actually quite valuable uh, in many ways. And the US is not in RCEP. And so I think this is a problem. US not in RCEP, US not in CPTPP and much more problematic for me on US policy, no forward agenda. None, as far as I can tell, nothing happening in terms of the trade agreement, a trade agenda, trade agreement, sense of what is a worker-centered policy, what does that mean? It's still unclear. I think that's deeply problematic because the rest of the world, especially this part of the world, is moving. They're integrating. They are designing policies and regulations that could potentially be at odds with what the U.S. ultimately decides it wants. That's problematic. I don't think the US has the luxury, myself, of being able to sit back and say, when we're ready and when we feel like it, and when we've decided on all well, the perfect whatever, 
we're going to come to you and then you'll join with us in whatever it is that we've come up with at that point. I think that's a real problematic stance, but it's one that I, I see uh, coming out of Washington. Um, well, really, certainly now, but even a little bit before uh, under the previous administration. And I think that's a problem because it's, a, it's going to be a disadvantage for American companies. What you cannot do increasingly in Asia, you cannot sit in Iowa, produce a product and ship it to Asia with the same economic benefits that someone has sitting in Australia or sitting in Japan to sell in and around Asia. You, you can't do that because you're not going to have access to crucially zero tariffs. You're not going to have the same services commitments. You're not going to have the same investment abilities and protections. You're not going to have access to some of the other stuff like government procurement contracts, potentially. That could be really interesting. And so I think the, the longer this goes on with the U.S. not engaged, the harder it will be for U.S. companies to be competitive in the region. That's not to say it's hopeless, but you know, any little, especially coming out of COVID, any little bit helps. And if you have lower costs compared to your competitors, you win. I know you just have a couple minutes left and let me ask you a couple questions related to the CPTPP if I could, and to the extent that you can sure. answer within your time, that'd be great. But the first one is, you know, hear a lot about pros and cons of these regional trade agreements, such as the CPTPP. In your, in your view, how successful has this agreement been for its current members you know, given the fact of taking into account the dampening effect of the pandemic, obviously, but has it resulted in an increased trade or economic growth for the CPTPP member countries? And the other, you, you talked about, let me, I'll try to fit it in real quick, so yeah. both at the same time. You talk about, you know, they might make special exceptions for China in its succession process for the CPTPP. And my question for you is, will China change the CPTPP or will CPTPP change China? Let me do the second one first. So the, 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 you're not supposed to change the rule book in CPTPP when you join. And so China would have to achieve CPTPP commitments, which I, I think it can. I don't think it's that difficult. Certainly, if Vietnam can do this and China's got the highest level political ambitions to do so, China can do so. Uh, so I, for me, that's not that interesting. They will negotiate. The negotiation is really about their own schedule, how quickly they reduce tariffs on which products in which areas at what speed, which services remain protected. They have to be a very small subset. So which are they, what are they? And we negotiate over that. What are China's commitments in government procurement? Which state-owned enterprises specifically will China want to continue to protect and which are potentially subject to CPTPP rules? Uh, that's what you're negotiating over. And again, I, to me, this is a manageable, it's not, it's not going to be simple, but I think it's manageable for China. Again, if you decide you want to do this and Vietnam decided they wanted to, you can do this if you're China. Um, so I, we'll see how that goes. And I think it ultimately, for me, the big benefit of CPTPP entry for China is that now you, China is inside the CPTPP and it has to align with the CPTPP. Will it do so 100%? Does any one of these countries do it 100%? I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure if I tried, I could find everybody is out of compliance somewhere. Um, but the, we'll see how close we get to the letter and crucially the spirit of the law. The spirit is the tough one with China. Um, so that's the Chinese discussion. On benefits for CPTPP, we don't see as many firms and statistics that reflect CPTPP benefits at the moment, partly because Entry into force happened and COVID happened a year later, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's a little, it's early days of the agreement and COVID has been so disruptive. How can you say what the benefits have actually been on trade flows and trade lanes? Part of the problem too with CPTPP in my view is that we have not done a very good job in general of convincing companies that it matters. So they kind of finished the negotiation and, and a little bit dropped the ball in terms of rolling this out to companies. What is it you need to do? What are the benefits that are on offer for you? How can you take advantage of this? Uh, but I think that the succession procedure will drive interest again. And now you have to really focus on what is it? And it's back in the news again. And when it's in the news, companies go, wait a minute, this is something interesting. Are we using it? What are the benefits, et cetera? So I think you're gonna see more traction for CPTPP going forward, especially in post COVID where everyone is looking for any kind of competitive advantage that they can get. So that's my sort of short answers to those questions. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, I and I, I, I really apologize <laughs> that I have to go, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. If people want to email me, that's fine. I'm happy to take email. 
It's elms at asiantradecenter.org and it's center spelled British style since we're in Singapore. Um, well, Debbie, so please do reach out. <laughs> Appreciate well, De it. Debbie, thank you so much for your time and giving us your insights and expertise. It's very much appreciated. And again, very informative Thanks. and interesting. Thanks. And, uh, and you can ask Bill all the tough questions because he'll well, answer I've got, them I've got a few questions that I was ahead for you, but I'll give them all to Bill now, so. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. This is working out well for me. So great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Right. Take care, Debbie. Bye-bye. All right, so we have our next panelist um, and I'll give a little bit longer uh, introduction since we have a little bit more time and he's got a long, uh, very distinguished career. But um, William Reinsch is currently the uh, show chair at the International Business at, at Centers for Strategic and International Studies or CISIS as it's known, and is a senior advisor at Kelly Dry and Warren LLP. Previously, he served for 15 years as president of the National Foreign Trade Council. And from 2001 to 2016, he concurrently served as a member of the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, teaching courses in globalization, trade policy, and politics. Bill also served as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Export Administration during the Clinton administration. And prior to that, he spent 20 years on Capitol Hill. He holds a BA and an MA in International Relations from the Johns Hopkins University and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, respectively. So we're very honored to have Bill with us today. Um, he's going to give some, his observations and opening remarks, and then we can open it up to questions, including a few that I have. Bill? Well, thank you very much, Brian. It's a real pleasure to, to uh, be with all of you. Um, I really enjoyed um, uh, Debbie's presentation. I agreed with most of it, um, and you asked her some of the questions that uh, were also hard, So, but I, I look forward to uh, anything that the audience wants to, uh, or you, wants to ask when I'm done. I've been asked to make a few comments about uh, the Biden administration's trade policy, uh, and particularly with respect to China, which is much uh, on everybody's mind, at least here these days. So let me make a few brief comments on both of those issues, and then we can uh, return to uh, CPTPP and RCEP or anything else that, that you want. I think uh, as far as uh, overall trade policy is concerned, the president made clear, uh, even during the campaign, that trade was not his highest priority that uh, dealing, with, uh, dealing with COVID and, and getting the, the economy restarted was his highest priority and that trade was going to take uh, second place or third place. And uh, <clears throat> that turned out to be an accurate statement. Uh, it's not at the top of his list. Uh, the common phrase here, if you ask anybody in the administration a question about trade, the answer is always the same, which is it's under review, quote, under quote. They've been under reviewing things for the last 11 months. Um, when they do talk about trade, what you hear is they want to pursue a trade policy for workers, a trade policy for the middle class. And people in, in my line of work are spending our time trying to figure out what that means. Um, I think it will mean three things. Uh, one, it will mean enforcement, uh, enforcement of obligations that our trading partners have taken on. That primarily refers to Mexico because uh, when the Trump administration renegotiated NAFTA and turned it into USMCA, uh, they uh, put in a significantly beefed up uh, uh, enforcement chapter, particularly for labor provisions. And uh, our new USTR ambassador, uh, Catherine Tai, uh, was working in the Congress at the time and was partly responsible for that result. So she has a personal stake in the outcome. Uh, and they're very much focused on, on making sure that, that those new provisions are, are operating uh, fully and successfully. And uh, short, in the short term, they appear to be. I mean, yeah, I think it's from the stand, a negotiating standpoint of success. Uh, they've also talked vaguely about um, trying to duplicate those enforcement provisions in other agreements, uh, but they haven't done anything about it. And it remains to be seen whether that's just talk or whether eventually they'll get around to it. When they do talk about it, they seem to be talking about uh, modifying existing agreements rather than negotiating new ones. Um, the second thing a trade policy for workers means is uh, making sure that the benefits of trade agreements are distributed uh, more favorably to workers uh, rather than to big corporations. Uh, this is a bone they throw to the, the left wing of the Democratic Party who believe that, that our trade policy for the last 30 years in general has 
been primarily to benefit large multinational corporations and has not benefited workers. You can agree or not agree with that as you wish, but I think that's lurking in the back of their minds. I think what's been frustrating about that for observers is that uh, I, we think of uh, trade agreements as, as creating benefits. Uh, and then we think of other government policies as distributing the benefits. Governments use tax policy, they use regulatory policy, they use education policy, they use adjustment policy or industrial policy to redistribute benefits. Uh, the point of a trade agreement primarily is to create benefits through more trade, more jobs, more growth. And it's been pointed out to them that if you're not negotiating anything, which they're not right now, you're not creating any new benefits. <laughs> so there really isn't anything to distribute. But uh, that's an important uh, plank, and we'll see that what that ends up meaning. Um, the third uh, piece, which I think is uh, the most relevant for, uh, for non-American uh, observers, uh, is reshoring. Uh, they really are focused on trying to bring American uh, companies back to the United States, particularly American manufacturing companies. Uh, I think, by and large, that's not going to work. But, uh, you know, they are riding a wave here where uh, large American companies in particular, uh, for some years, probably at least five, dating back to before Trump, have uh, been thinking seriously about how to shorten their supply chains. Uh, there's growing concern about political risk. There's growing concern about, uh, about uh, rising uh, transportation costs, particularly ocean freight. Uh, COVID accelerated those concerns and the uh, port backlogs we have now on West Coast ports uh, have accelerated those concerns even farther. So there's a lot of companies, uh, without any pressure from the United States government, there are a lot of companies that are just thinking about maybe it would be better um, if, uh, first of all, I had supply chains that were more resilient, which meant, which means multiple sources for parts and components, uh, some of which are, uh, if not in the United States, are nearby, are near shored. So you're going to see more of that, uh, both as an element of government policy but also simply because that's a calculation that I think more and more of our companies are going to be made, uh, going to be making. Uh, if you look at, um, I mean, the other factor I would mention is, um, and this uh, we're getting now into China, uh, has been the combining, if you will, of, of trade policy and, and security into a single focus. This is partly stimulated by uh, China's articulation of its civil military fusion policy where it's increasingly difficult to, for us to sort out uh, who is engaged in military activity, in which case we are concerned about technology transfer to those parties, um, and who is not, in which case in the past we've not been concerned. But if the Chinese are pursuing a policy in which all companies might be doing both, uh, that puts a burden on the United States to reevaluate its, its, uh, its uh, policies with respect to uh, uh, inbound investment and outbound technology transfer and export controls. And you see these things now being all kind of mushed together, uh, particularly in the information communication technology sector. Look at Huawei, look at ZTE, look at other cases like that. There's a genuine concern in the United States that uh, these uh, companies, their hardware, their software, uh, have the capacity and could be used to undermine our security. So that's become an element of our trade policy consideration uh, that uh, was by and large not there uh, five or 10 years ago. And I don't think it's going to go away. And I think you'll see as the Biden trade policy evolves, I think the area where you'll see the least change uh, is on uh, both export controls and inbound uh, investment reviews. And there's some discussion about outbound investment reviews, uh, although that would require legislation, which is uh, actually will be proposed um, probably in the next month. It's going to be uh, an amendment to the uh, annual defense bill. Uh, whether it will pass or not I, is uncertain. Uh, it, it, Congress has considered that issue in the past and decided not to do it. Uh, and that was just three years ago. Uh, I can't tell as of today whether enough opinion has shifted to um, produce a different outcome this time around. But uh, all of that is not going to be uh, a lot of much different uh, with respect to a lot of things, and particularly China, uh, the Biden trade policy is, is, I mean, some critics have basically called it Trump light, uh, not changing a lot of what Trump did, uh, but having rhetoric that is 
uh, less bluster, less in your face, uh, and also less uh, scattershot and, and more, more targeted. Uh, and when I talk about tariffs in a few minutes, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So I think that uh, uh, aside from that, the, the other new element, uh, which is, I think materially different from Trump is there's a genuine concern in this administration about human rights uh, and in particular about forced labor and other violations of human rights. That's a concern that transcends China in particular, but in Asia, that's obviously the place where it's very much an issue. Uh, and is in the minds of, of uh, many Western countries. And I think for Trump, uh, the, the human rights issues uh, were, were uh, elements of leverage. I don't think fundamentally he cared about human rights. He cared about leverage. Uh, Biden cares about human rights. And that's going to be a significant element of our policy um, going forward with respect to everybody. Um, now, with respect to China in specific, um, you know, the metaphor that I use when I talk about uh, China is, is, is the race metaphor. When you're in a race, uh, a marathon probably, uh, there's only two ways to win. Uh, one is to run faster and the other is to trip the other guy. And uh, the, both policies are appropriate uh, at different times. And the Biden administration is, is pursuing both of them. Uh, the one that they figured out the first and most thoroughly is the run faster part. And if you could look, look at the reconciliation bill that Congress is debating now, look at the infrastructure bill that just was passed last week, look at the so-called CHIPS Act, which is a, uh, a program of substantial uh, new investment in semiconductor uh, research development and production. Um, this administration is devoting a substantial amount of government resources and government attention uh, to uh, trying to make uh, United States uh, innovators, uh, more innovative, manufacturers, more competitive. I think they understand that the global competition uh, we face is really not so much in China, but in everywhere else. Uh, the Chinese, if you look at Chinese writings on the subject, their 13th and forthcoming 14th five-year plan, their <laughs> Made in China 2025 document, you know, what they, what they want to do is create global leaders in a bunch of selected technologies. And those tend to be uh, mostly sectors where the United States is the current global leader. So it's a challenge for us. And I think what Biden has figured out is the best way to meet that challenge is to make sure that, that our, uh, our companies are in a better position to do that. Uh, and knowing that they'll be doing it not so much in China, but everywhere else, in Africa, in Latin America, in India, in Southeast Asia, and in Europe. So that part I think is well formulated, well articulated, and it's easy for you to look up. The part about tripping the other guy uh, is not so clear. Ambassador Tai gave a speech at CSIS um, well, just about a month ago. And uh, basically what she, she tried to walk a very fine line because I think the administration is divided internally. What she said was that we're going to pursue a dialogue with China she never mentioned the word negotiation. She said dialogue and conversation and talk. We're going to pursue that talk. We don't expect it to amount to much, but we're going to do it anyway, which kind of begs the question of, well, if you don't think anything's going to happen, why are you doing it? And I think that she did it that way because there, I think are, there's division inside the White House uh, between people who want to have a dialogue because they think it will amount to something uh, and the hardliners who think that it's a waste of time in the case of China, at least right now. Uh, and so uh, they you know, tried to walk a very fine line between these two groups and said, they're going to have the dialogue, but they don't have high expectations for it. What is that dialogue going to be about? Uh, it's primarily going to be about um, uh, enforcement of what Trump negotiated. So phase one is coming to an end next February. The purchase commitments are coming to an end at the end of this year. Uh, the Chinese have not met all of their commitments. Uh, they've actually done better than I think a lot, a lot of people expected on the non-purchase side. But even there, there's a number of things that have been, uh, that they promised to do that they have not done. Uh, and they are short on the purchase commitments uh, pretty much across the board, although uh, some sectors like energy are much worse than agriculture, which is, is 
not that bad and, and may by the end of the year uh, get a lot better. So in the near term, the dialogue they're having with, uh, with Liu Ha in this case uh, is going to be about how we get them to, um, to uh, meet their uh, remaining commitments. Uh, and what they do next, I think, depends on how those conversations go and how the Chinese react. I think what they want to do is find a way to uh, get the tariff issue, uh, meaning our tariffs on Chinese, the Trump tariffs, um, um, off the table so that we can move on. But I think they don't want to do it just by eliminating them. I think what they want to do is to identify those sectors that have been the biggest beneficiaries of uh, Chinese subsidies, uh, Chinese intellectual property theft, or other Chinese uh, unfair practices from the US point of view. Uh, and uh, those are sectors I think where the tariffs will not only remain, but they might be increased. Um, at the same time, sectors that don't fit into that category, uh, I think they want to make the tariffs go away um, eventually. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think anything's going to happen that's uh, significant until after the end of phase one. So uh, this is going to be, you know, off into the future, but uh, that seems to be the way they're going. They, Ambassador Tai was, I mean, she was evasive, frankly, on a lot of issues, but she did seem to suggest that she didn't think that, that uh, they were going to try to move on and negotiate a phase two. As I said, she didn't use the word negotiation. Um, so it's kind of in a state of flux and, uh, they, uh, um, I think it's going to depend on, on what happens. It'll depend a little bit on what happens Monday night, Monday night, U S time when uh, Biden and, and, and president Xi, um, have their, uh, their virtual summit. Uh, and I, I don't think people expect that to solve problems. Uh, I think there is some expectation in the trade area that, they may set up processes for solving problems, which is what usually comes out of a presidential summit. And of course, as you all know, there's a lot of other things to talk about that are not exactly trade. Uh, the US and China have a whole bunch of issues that, uh, uh, that where we disagree and, and some where we're trying very hard to work together or I, well, we're trying to work, to hard, to work toward the same end uh, in climate, for example. So there's a lot for them to talk about and trade is only part of it. Um, Finally, if I can take one more minute, I'll preempt one of Brian's questions. Uh, and it was a question that uh, actually came into the chat, I think, while Debbie was talking, which is, what was the US gonna do about uh, CPTPP? And on that, I would just say, there, there's a difference of opinion in the United States about that. I think everybody in the academic and think tank community would say, the smart thing for the United States to do would be to join it. That uh, Trump's decision to pull out of TPP uh, was an historic mistake uh, that compromises the U.S. role in the, re re uh, re in the re region, you know, undermines our credibility there and has set us back in too many ways to count. And that the right answer is to uh, return. Um, the administration has not taken that line. Um, I've accused them uh, of basically fighting the last war uh, those of you that follow this know that TPP was controversial in the United States in the Obama administration. There's a lot of people from the Obama administration in the current administration. Um, they're still fighting that war. They think it's controversial. Um, I think they're wrong about that. I think uh, opinion has changed, but that's their view. They don't seem to want to do it. And that has divided the, the, the observer community, if you will, into kind of two parts. Uh, part one, which is sort of people like me who say, that's the right answer and we should just keep telling them it's the right answer uh, and eventually they'll figure it out. Um, the other group says, you're wasting your time telling them it's the right answer, let's go to plan B. Uh, and then there's a debate about what is plan B. It appears right now that plan B is, let's do a regional digital trade agreement. And then there is, further division over, well, does that mean the United States should lead a, a negotiation on an Indo-Pacific digital trade agreement, or does it mean the United States should try to join DEPA? Uh, and that's an unanswered question at this point. What I can tell you is that 
it is abundantly clear to the Biden administration that they have no Asian trade policy and that they need one. Uh, and they are very actively trying to figure out what they want to do. Uh, they are not yet willing to uh, throw in the towel and just say, let's join CPTPP because that's the only thing that makes sense. Um, I think they will get there eventually, but it will take them several years. Um, and in the short run, they will probably pick, they will probably do something else. Uh, and it will probably be in the digital trade area because they know that that's an area that will not arouse political controversy in the United States. So with that, I'll stop and uh, go back to Brian. It's all yours. Great, thank you very much, Bill. It's great to hear your perspectives and observations and insights from uh, inside the Beltway, if you will, um, and from the perspective of what's going on in the White House and the administration. You, you, as you said, you did preempt a few of my questions, um, which is very smart, but um, had a couple questions follow up on that. And you mentioned, I think both you and Debbie agree that the, the Biden administration really has no forward-leaning or forward-looking trade policy, especially when it comes to Asia. And you mentioned about you know the CPTPP debate um, the digital, you know, um, trade agreement that there perhaps some within the administration is looking at, you know, as being positive, you know, way to to retake some of the U.S. Uh, influence and and uh, reach into the region, absent the CPTPP and of course not being part of RCEP. But all of these agreement, well, the digital agreement would be something different. But whether if even if just, if the administration decides to uh, rejoin the CPTPP. What would be needed to be revised? Because you mentioned earlier too about the emphasis on free trade agreements is not looking for new trade agreements, but rather to revise and update like we did with USMCA. Um, what would it take for the Biden administration to, you know, to re-enter negotiations to revise the CPTPP? And in, you know, obviously they need TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. And of course that expired uh, you know, last July. Do you see oh, that? Okay. Yes. <laughs> You know, um, is that something that they would, you know, seek con concurrently as a prerequisite? You know, how does how does that come into play? Well, you know, I'd have to check the law because um, um, you're probably on, on the TPA issue. I have to check the law. Sometimes, if you well, they never actually. I think they never actually submitted the agreement. Sometimes, if the agreement is submitted prior to the expiration of the law even though if it's not acted on, the authority is continues to exist for that agreement alone. But I think in this case, that's not right and they would need new authority. But the, the, your question is a substantive one, I think more than a process one. Um, I'm not sure they've wrestled with that yet. Um, you know, had it been three years ago, I would have said, you know, the easy answer was just put back in the provisions that were, were removed. Uh, from TPP when they established CPTPP. Uh, most of those were IP related provisions. But now, you know, five years later, um, I don't think that's what this administration is interested in. First of all, their views on IP and IP protection are, uh, I think, are not the same as the Obama administration's. Um, so I think what you, what I would look at is uh, two things. I would look at the digital provisions of the US Japan agreement. And I would look at the digital uh, and the labor and environment provisions of the USMCA, US Canada Mexico agreement. And I would take my cue from that. Those are the, the biggest priorities for this administration over and over again are labor and environment. And those may not be big issues actually for CPTPP members anyway. I mean, the Canadians and the Mexicans have already agreed to them. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, the provisions that we're talking about would be that onerous for the other members, but uh, I think for this administration, I would look at uh, those later agreements, Japan and USMCA, and uh, things that are in there that are not in CPTPP, that's what they'll put forward. Another question for you is, you know, is the value of the CPTPP and RCEP, these type of agreements, is it more of an economic um, or a geopolitical um, value or both? Well, you know, for the United States, when I give sort of trade policy speeches, I said one of the, the, the unusual or amusing things about our trade agreements is most of them are not about trade. Uh, they're mostly about something else. Uh, Panama was about the canal. Uh, Colombia was about Venezuela. Bahrain was about the Fifth Fleet. Uh, Oman was about the Persian Gulf. Uh, Korea was about, you know, China and Japan. Uh, most of them are about something else. 
Uh, and Obama was upfront about that with TPP, probably more upfront than he, than he should have been from a political point of view. But he was clear, this is, it's not about, I mean, he didn't put it this way, but basically it's not about market access. It's about the US presence in the, in the Pacific and the US uh, making clear to the countries of the Pacific region that we are here to stay and we are committed. And that is, point, by the way, is a point of view that this president, uh, Biden, clearly subscribes to. And, uh, and their problem, the thing they're wrestling with is they understand that sending an aircraft carrier through the South China Sea every other month is not good enough. You know, you have to have an economic presence as well as a military and political presence. And they're, they're trying to figure out uh, what to do about it. But, uh, but for them and for us, it has a lot more to do with I think with sort of the symbolism and the display of commitment and actually, you know, bluntly providing a counterweight to the Chinese uh, in the region for the smaller countries that would prefer to, you know, walk the line between two large powers rather than have only one present there trying to dominate, uh, trying to dominate the region. Um, the other thing I'd say is one of the, the odd things about the Biden administration is they seem in general, not just with respect to Asia, they don't seem very interested in market access. You know, I, when you talk to them about Europe, um, it's, not, it's all about labor environment. It, it's, they don't seem very interested in market access. Mm, I agree with that. Now, uh, it's, it's ironic because there's a lot of people in the United States that are very interested in market <laughs> access and would like to sell more stuff. Including but, all uh, of our exporters, yeah. Yeah, they don't have, uh, including farmers, but yeah. they don't have the administrations here right now. Yeah. You mentioned about the South China Sea, and obviously these agreements being not only economic, but geopolitical as well. And a question from the audience is, how will China's involvement in the RCEP and possibly the CPTPP down the road change the political landscape in the South China Sea dispute? Well, I think that's a question that would best be answered by the, 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 the literal nations, the other, you know, the other nations that, that, that border the South China Sea. I think from the U.S. point of view, uh, China's presence in those agreements and our absence uh, is something that simply gives them more regional leverage, uh, which is why so many of us are pressing the administration to respond by uh, re, you know, joining or rejoining uh, CPTPP. Uh, if we don't do that, then we are ceding um, our interest in the region uh, really to, uh, to China. And I think that is true in the South China Sea as, as well. But whether the agreement itself has an impact uh, on uh, on the, the 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 political or, or security issues surrounding the, the South China Sea and the various islands and other installations that are there, I, I I'm inclined to think not. Yeah. Another question you mentioned earlier, Bill, about the the divide, if you will, or certainly at least the debate within the Biden administration on where to go forward with trade. Um, in terms of Asia, of course, and other areas as well. And a question from the audience, another question is, is that you know, Chinese policies are often presented as monolithic and clear authority driven. To what extent are there differences within Chinese leadership, hardliners versus softliners when it comes to trade, much like the Biden administration? And if so, what areas are there internal disagreements? Well, I have a colleague who uh, at CSIS, Jude Blanchett, who studies those issues rather closely. Um, and I uh, wish he were here because he could give a better answer than I could. I think my impression right now is that, you know, of course there are differences of opinion uh, in China. They're all, there always have been, and uh, that doesn't go away. But uh, Xi Jinping has done a very good job of subordinating or either suppressing or subordinating, you, you choose your word, uh, alternative points of view. And we don't see right now, uh, we don't see right now a lot of internal uh, overt dissent or disagreement uh, with uh, what uh, President Xi wants to do. Uh, we believe that there are uh, senior Chinese who are very unhappy with the, some of the policies that he's pursuing, but uh, uh, nobody's saying anything about it, and we don't see any signs that that uh, they're going to. Now, you know, the twentieth Party Congress is coming up, uh, where and he's got to uh, be, you know, obtain approval for a third term, which would be 
unprecedented, or well, at least since uh, Deng Xiaoping un unprecedented. You know, maybe something will happen between now and then, but right now we don't see that. We see uh, we see a very unified voice presented outside, and we don't see uh, a lot of uh, internal dissent. Okay. I think we're just about out of time. So um, unless, Bill, you want to have any final thoughts or observations, I'll turn it back to uh, Young Sung. Uh, no, I'm fine. I'm uh, Whatever you want is fine with me. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, again, you know, tremendous, uh, interestingly, uh, insights and observations on this area of Asia Pacific, but also what's going on within the Biden administration in terms of trade policy or lack of, as you've mentioned. So <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bill. Happy to be with you. Young thank Sung? You. Young Sung? mute and I have to start my video. Okay, unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time. I know the originally this webinar is scheduled until 6.15, but CBA has another event that starts at 6 p.m. Uh, this evening, and uh, particularly that uh, this is organized by the Dean's office, so I have to respect that. So i like to finish our programming time in case that uh, you're also planning to attend that event. But before we wrap up the webinar, I actually have my own question. So I'd like to ask this question to Bill. To the best of my knowledge, RCP is the first free trade agreement in which all top three trading partners of the US in East Asia, namely China, Japan, and Korea have participated. Do you think this will make the US more uneasy or concerned about losing its market in Asia, and particularly now that China submitted a formal application to CPTPP, and South Korea, the sixth largest trading partner with the US has stepped up its effort to join the CPTPP. Uh, maybe that uh, South Korea's move will influence the US decision to join the CPTPP. So I'd like to hear your take on this issue. I think it. Uh, I think what happens with CPTPP CP, CP, will have more of an impact on the U.S. than what happens in RCEP. Uh, I mean, the, U the U.S. was never invited to join RCEP, and it's not really an issue. And I think, uh, I mean, Debbie is right. It's not viewed here as uh, as as an ambitious agreement mm -hmm. uh, as CPTPP is. I mean, that may be wrong, but that's the way people look at it. Uh, China joining CP, CPTPP, and I'm, uh, I'm inclined to agree with Debbie, at least in the sense that the, the people who think they can't possibly get in, they can't possibly meet the standards, I think are wrong. Uh, and I think Debbie is, is uh, closer to being correct than, uh, than the other view. I mean, it's going to be complicated, but uh, uh, I think that uh, it's already made the United States a little bit nervous, and it's made a lot of people in the academic community nervous because once China is in, then they can prevent us from getting in. Right. Uh, and we're very worried about that. And I think what's going to happen uh, is that the CPTP members are going to probably take the applications up in the order in which they've arrived. Uh, so UK first, China second, Taiwan third, and then anybody else who comes in. So, you know, we're already, uh, we're already well behind in the game. And I think people are worried about that. I see. Okay, thanks, Bill. Deborah, unfortunately, uh, she had to leave earlier uh, for talking to LMU community out of your very busy schedule. We really appreciate your sharing with us your insights into the US trade policy and the implications of these two important free trade agreements. Uh, your presentation was very informative and insightful. Thanks, Brian, for moderating an intriguing conversation with Bill and Deborah. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program actually next week. Uh, please stay safe and healthy until then. When you leave this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a brief survey. I really appreciate it if you can complete it. Thank you so much again, everyone, and good night. Thank you, Yung Sung. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Brian. you very much. Thank you.